Yes, I'm going to speak about, um, I'm going to present melting curves and melting relations in order to discuss if the, some melting occurs in the deep double prime layer, but I will also present some data related to the magma ocean uh, properties. So the question basically is related to these kind of things for the D double prime layer. Does some liquid can uh, happen and uh, to which extent and then uh, is it going to stay on the bottom of the mantle or is it going to go up? Uh, we will see that in a moment. Uh, this work is a co collaboration between our two labs and uh, we should say that without the European synchrotron we couldn't do that kind of thing. So there are two questions first to know if there is partial melting. One is the temperature gradient and there has been uh, some discussion already at uh, this conference and I would like to say thank you for the invitation to give and Barbara. Uh, and to this conference we had a lot of uh, discussions already about the, the thermal gradient in the D double prime layer which is not that well constrained, uh, as you know. But what is well constrained is that there are some features there and uh, there are different interpretations for it. I'm not going to speak about this because we already heard many more information than these ones, but some features here must be uh, explained. So back to the temperature gradient. There is the, I took a few of them, there are several others. We should separate them maybe in two different uh, categories. I would say the classical ones that, that follow the adiabats and that are, uh, are assuming a, a relatively uh, cold core. And the temperature in this case would not exceed uh, something like 3000K, but I think in this uh, workshop we had a lot of uh, information about having a very uh, hot core. But I should say, uh, as it was discussed by Dain Shim this morning, that this uh, very hot core in this particular paper uh, tried to provide evidences for, for a very hot core ba based on the, on the double crossing of the phase transition. But this is probably not the right argument for, for arguing for a very hot core because as we saw, the perovskite to post-perovskite transition might be complicated and uh, this uh, the transition is only valid for pure MgSiO3, so maybe the core can be hot or cold, but not necessarily due to this particular argument of a loop of post-perovskite, maybe due to other things. So this uh, diagram, we will uh, use it in, in a while after we will determine the melting curves of the, of the mantle. In order to determine those melting curves, we have to look at what is the, 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 was the, the, the references a few years ago. So there was some work for the pure phases, but the pure phases are not that relevant for, for the paralytic mantle or chondritic mantle or whatever mantle you like, because uh, of course there are more refractory and, and the melt is a mixture of phases and the mixture of phases would, would lower the melting point very much. So there was these works from Zer and Buller and quarters, which uh, were uh, uh, determination using uh, using eye, using the eye, using the microscope of change in, in, in a sample behavior under the laser eating in a diamond cell. And they, they found that this could be the, the solidus and this could be the liquidus. And there was another work from uh, Irose and uh, co-authors, which uh, was working for the for the for basalts, and that was a slightly lower to the to the power light for the Zeran Buller paper. And this, this, there was this paper here from uh, Olin Lawrence about uh, melting of uh, olivine using shock uh, techniques. So we were actually two groups uh, uh, led by Guillaume Fiquet and I using exactly the same technique. Not exactly the same loading in diamond cell, I will show you later, but the same type of, uh, of uh, um, criterion to determine the, the melting of the of the sample. And so we used the um, X-ray diffraction in, uh, in the synchrotron ring. We, we, the X-ray beam is going there. This is a diamond cell. And you're looking at the, at the diffraction cone, which will give an information on what is the mineralogic content in the sample. There is um, uh, a laser path. This is the old picture. We now have other lasers, but it doesn't change anything, basically. So we have laser eating from the front and from the backs. And we determine the temperature using some uh, some optics. So we can, 
during the laser heating, uh, look at the sample. For example, I will sh show here a few solidus evidences. Solidus means some phase start to disappear. For example, here at a, at a given, this is 300K, there is uh, the calcium uh, perovskite that is here, and here is the magnesium silicate perovskite phase. And at a given temperature, some, some uh, peaks will disappear, which means that this phase is not present anymore. It has, it has molten. So here you can see an integration. Here at a low temperature, there are those peaks, which, is, which are, this is an integration of this uh, image, where you see the calcium silicate phase that has disappeared. The magnesium silicon, the ferropericlase, uh, is not clearly visible on the diffraction pattern. The reason is it overlaps with the, with the main uh, magnesium silicate perovskite uh, peaks. And the sample looks like that uh, on, under uh, SEM. The, there is uh, still some, uh, some uh, fresh, some fresh uh, glass, glass uh, starting material. In the middle, you have a change of shape. But uh, since we only reached the solidus, the, the change uh, in shape didn't, uh, doesn't look that much compared to when you reach the liquidus where you create a ball. This, in this case, it's a relatively big one in the image, but uh, relatively small in the scale still. And uh, for, uh, for the liquidus evidence, it's a little bit more complicated because um, it depends on the sample geometry, as I will show a little bit later. But disappearance of peak is relatively easy. You just have to go uh, further from the sample. You have no more diffraction. So the criterion can be discussed. Is, is it a change in position of the sample during the laser eating? Or another criterion, but there are several. One is the reappearance of uh, peaks of sample after you quench. So you, you basically have, uh, this is KCL pressure medium in this case, you have the diffraction peaks of the perovskite, which uh, will grow with temperature and which are there. And when it's melted, there is no more peaks. And when you quench, you see new appearance of peaks. So it means you've been through the, the melting. And there is other criterion, which was basically the one that were, were used by the, the, the Buller group and also others in the, in the world, where you have some change in the, in the optical properties or change in, in, the, in the way the, the sample is, is uh, absorbing the laser. So here we reach a temperature where, where even if you increase the la laser power, you simply increase the size of the, of the liquid uh, region and, until there is a kind of uh, increase suddenly of temperature because uh, also the pressure medium will, will melt. So this is the curves we obtained. So I plot on the top the, our data points with the, with the curves here for the, for the solidus and the liquidus of uh, contritic material. There are two important things. One is that the, the lines are uh, very linear compared to what was uh, presented, uh, proposed in the past. And uh, the difference between the two is relatively large. So um, it's, uh, it means the liquid will have a composition relatively different from the solid when you will melt uh, the, the mantle. Here I also plotted the results uh, from uh, Guillaume, which are for a slightly different uh, composition, but it shouldn't change the the pattern so much. The solidus is not uh, too different. The liquidus is, is, uh, is severely higher for Guillaume compared to mine. So I'm not going to discuss much the difference between the two. I think we need additional studies that will uh, help us to make the difference. But I will try to, to, to scan a few, uh, a few uh, implications for, for, the, uh, for the melting curves. And I will choose the mine in particular. But the implication I use are also valid for the the Guillaume melting curves. So one thing is about uh, melting in uh, D double prime layer. So I have plotted here our curves, and here I have plotted the, the Erlun uh, data points. And you see that you need the highest uh, core estimations in order to melt the material in the D double prime layer, which means it's not impossible that some melting would occur here for pyrolytic or chondritic mantle, but you have to prove or you have to think that, that the core is very hot. A second possibility to melt 
in this region is, of course, to change the composition. If you put additional uh, material like water, like sodium, potassium, other elements that would, that would lower the melting curve of the solidus compared to pyrolite, then you could melt those materials at lower temperature uh, compared to pyrolite. The second uh, uh, implication is related to, uh, to the early Earth. So there was a picture shown several times by Labrosse uh, where you, you, there was a, is there, as mentioned here, how, how can we have liquid on the, on the, in the, magma, in the surfacic uh, magma oceans as well as a liquid on the basal uh, location? So, this is simply trying to find a temperature gradient around the Earth at a given time in the early Earth, where you would have here a, a liquid, and in this case, the liquid should, should be of the same, uh, same composition than, than chondritic material. So you would have here a liquid uh, at a given time and a liquid here. So you have to cross like this the, 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 um, the, the liquidus, which is not impossible, but if you take something that is completely melted and you, and you try to cool it down and cross the liquidus, it means you're, you're going to create a shell which is perfectly made of the liquidus phase, which is actually the, the perovskite, uh, magnesium perovskite. So this picture is not impossible, but you, you have to, compare to what he presented in the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the workshop, it's not necessarily at the bottom in, in this case. I mean, according to the, to the um, melting curves, it's not necessarily at the bottom that you would crystallize, it, but maybe uh, in, in the center, but this is a long-term discussion. The, song, the second thing which is uh, really dramatic in, in my opinion, it's here. If you want to melt very much the Earth, and this is even more likely for, for the Guillaume melting curves and the Guillaume liquidus, if you want to melt completely the Earth, you have to go to very high uh, surface temperature, very high uh, potential temperature of, of uh, for example, 2,500K. And th in this case, it has been shown that the mantle is simply vaporizing. The vaporization of forsterite, which is a, a relatively uh, refractory material, starts at 2,000K. So here it's very active and it creates rock vapor uh, around the, the Earth, the primitive Earth. And the, this rock vapor, it has been shown that the, the temperature would, would, would go down very fast in a thousand or, or a couple of thousand years because the, then the heat and, and is going very, very fast because the rock vapor is transparent to, to, the, to the radiation, thermal radiation. So that can be discussed in, in, in the future. And I will make some preliminary conclusion for this part where Maybe classical may be wrong, but the classical still exists. Uh, and in this case, uh, if the classical uh, thermal uh, profiles are correct, then there should be no uh, melting in the D double prime layer. And uh, the core can be hot, or the D double prime can contain feasible, feasible elements, lowering the melting point. In this case, we could, we could certainly have some, uh, some uh, partial melt. So now I will, I will uh, discuss about the second part of the talk. And for the second part of the talk, um, we want to uh, establish if the liquids uh, are buoyant or not. Is the liquid is going to go up or is the liquid going to remain at the, at the, in the D double prime layer? So there was a study by uh, Funamori, which is a thermodynamical modeling, where he is just relatively well made because he used the right values for every parameters. In order to know the liquid density, you, you have two parameters, of course, uh, the mass, molar mass, and the volume. So the volume of melting can be of a few percent, and uh, it decreases with pressure because the, the liquid... Uh, structure is going closer and closer to, to the structure of the, of, the, of the solid phases. So if you look at the, at the volume of melting at low pressures, it, it, they decrease slightly. But for dense phases like the perovskite, like the ferropericlase, the, the, the volume of melting is going to remain um, 
positive, at least for the pressure conditions of the Earth. The reason is like you have some, uh, basically some electrons and you can compress the electrons, but it doesn't matter too much where the atoms are located. But if you have some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some cations, some uh, uh, movements of, of, the, of the atom themselves, I mean, it doesn't change too much the, the density. The second thing is something we analyzed uh, in this paper, is the partitioning of iron between the, the liquid and the solid. We have to know that, the, of course, iron is heavier than magnesium, but iron is also increasing slightly the volume because its size is slightly uh, bigger. It's bigger in, 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 the, in the high spin state, but it's almost the same than the magnesium in the low spin state. So the, the, the increase of the liquid volume by putting iron inside is a little bit controversial, but still it's a, big, it's a bit uh, bigger. And the second parameter is uh, SiO2 ratio. SiO2 is not the densest phase, and SiO2 is very incompressible. So in this diagram, the highest you have, uh, the highest is the SiO2 content in the liquid, the more the magma will float. And the highest the iron content is in the liquid, and the more the magma will sink. And this difference between this curve and this curve is related to here, to the difference in, uh, in uh, compressibility of the liquid and the solid. So we have to know where we are in this diagram in order to know if the liquid will be buoyant or not. So additional to the diffraction uh, patterns uh, show, as shown before, we have put some, uh, some uh, fluorescence detector in a similar way than in, uh, in uh, SEM, so scanning electron microscope, but here it's, uh, it's with the X-rays that we will uh, excite the, the atoms instead of the electrons in, in uh, SEM. Here's one of the geometry, but we use also other geometry at 90 degrees. And the cell here is located on, on a very precise positioning system, so we can scan the, the cell and look at the different regions where it's melted, molten, and, and, and solid. I will show you in a minute. And we also have two different informations. One is a diffraction. From diffraction here, as I shown before, this time it's sodium chloride pressure medium, we see the magnesium perovskite, the ferropericlase, the calcium silicate also. And when we map the sample, we can tell after we melted the samples, we, we have used the laser, we, mo we molten the sample, and we, have, we scan, and we can see there is a, there is a rim of, uh, which is very enriched in perovskite, which is basically around the, 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 the place where we have molten the sample. And using the, the fluorescence, so this is fluorescence P, uh, diffraction diagram, we take the the, the parts which is related to iron. For, for the, so we can also scan the sample and know the repartition, the, 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 our, the segregation of iron in our sample. So we can have here at one given resolution, it, here at a much higher resolution using another beam line, which the resolution is basically half a micron. We can see that uh, where in the center where, where was located the, the X-ray spot, the X-ray beam, sorry, the laser beam. The laser beam, when we, when we melted the sample, where was located the laser beam, we have more iron than uh, in a surrounding uh, uh, part of the sample where we have the highest amount of diffraction. So where is the major amount of perovskite is the lowest amount of iron, and where is the center of the hot spot, the center of the laser beam, is the highest amount of iron. So. Indeed, iron is uh, incompatible with, the, with the, the, the magnesium silicate perovskite relative to the liquid. But if you look here to the raw data, it's just taking this strip here. If you see here, already the intensity of the, of the fluorescence uh, radiation is only twice that of the, in, in the perovskite region. And it's the same thing for the other one. Meaning that even looking at that roughly, the partitioning coefficient should be close to two. Even looking at that, you, you, can, you can guess. However, so this is our data here where it's close to two because you have twice more iron in the center where, where you have the, the, the hot spot where it was molten and you have twice less where there was the perovskite. So the, the partitioning coefficient between solid and liquid is, is about half. And as, as it was already mentioned, uh, this uh, yesterday, 
the, there is a paper uh, made, it was one year before, by the Japanese group where they found a patching coefficient which at, at the chromatal bond there is more 0, 0,1, so it means 10 times more iron in the liquid compared to uh, the iron in the perovskite. And in this case, they, 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 they use this data to say the liquid is going down. In our case, we will see in a minute what it says, but it's a really different data. So why, why is it such a difference? There are different things we can explore to, to try to find a difference. One is the sample composition. We use the chondritic glass, so it contains all the elements, especially aluminum, and they used olivine, which is R3. And this has been shown a long time ago by, by uh, basically the, in Bayreuth, even if Wood was not necessarily in Bayreuth, but he did his experiments there. They show, here, here is, is an experiment for partitioning of the iron between the, the ferropaic clays and the perovskite. For the same amount of iron in the ferropaic clays, let's say 10%. If you have no aluminum in the system, so it's the same FAO activity in the capsule. For the same FAO activity in the capsule, you have 0.1% per of iron in the perovskite. For the same FAO activity, if you put aluminum in your system, you multiply by seven the amount of iron that would go in the perovskite. Aluminum forces iron to go in the perovskite. So that's one point, using olivine to try to, 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 uh, to, uh, to retrieve the, 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 the patching coefficient between a solid and a liquid is not a good idea. And this, this was also shown by this diagram, where they show here is a different uh, end members, the SiO2, the 2 plus end member, and the 3 plus end members. They show here, it was another study uh, in Bayreuth, that, that it goes along its trend, it, this trend means the, the aluminum and iron triplets love each other and go together in the phase. Uh, this is why the aluminum uh, favors the, the Fe in the perovskite. There is a second uh, difference, which is uh, the way the, the, the experiment is prepared. I, I don't think one is better than the other. I, I, I actually like very much this one. Guillaume also uses it a lot. It provides a lot of information. But it's different in terms of the thermal gradient. What they do here, uh, they do uh, axial cut. I mean, in order to, to do axial cut, you want to, to cut the sample in a vertical axis. In order to do that, you need to have a sample that you can touch once it's, it's melt, molten. So you need a thicker one, because you want to cut it with the fib. And this means, at the highest pressure, that you will have a thermal gradient in your sample that is relatively large. You cannot use a, a large uh, insulating material. In our case, we used, and this is the molten part, and this is the perovskite, and we look at the, at the um, partitioning between this melt and this part. We do a, a radial scan. A radial scan means you can use sample as thin as you want, and you can use the, the insulating material to, to the, the right thickness, and basically we used one third, one third, one third which makes the, the thermal gradient uh, much more uh, developed in, in insulating material because anyway, the diamond is not developing any, any thermal gradient at all because it's the most conductive material you have. So you can eat a little bit the surface of the diamond, but not much. In terms of the, of the, of the quenching of, of your melt, this changes completely the pictures because if you have here a melt, then when you're going to quench, and this has been, has been demonstrated for, for the experiments at low pressures, when they analyze the more uh, how it is produced and how to produce 3%, 5% of, of the liquid, you have to take the liquid out of, of the capsule by cracks in the capsule or something. You cannot measure the liquid composition at a low degree of partial melting from a quench sample because when you quench, what happens is that you start recrystallizing the phases that touches the liquid and, and you, you get something at the end which you don't know exactly if it was the liquid. In our case here, I mean, as I mentioned in the first sentence, a liquid is a mixture of phases. So what you want to know here is not only the very fine grains where, where it's very much enriched in iron, you want to look at the, at the liquid composition. And if I may go back a little bit in the picture here, you can see where, when we had the highest resolution, there are parts where, where the, the iron is, is really rich in, in those balls of, of liquid that were, were produced by, by the lasers. But these parts are certainly ferropaic clays. 
this is not this is not the, the liquid composition here. It's it, the liquid composition is a sum of the different phases you have to find here. So I don't I don't say these things are, are, are wrong. I mean it's it's nice pictures, but but where was the melt? Is there some crystallization of the perovskite around that, that is going to increase artificially the the Fe content in the in the remaining phases that crystallize the the, the last ones? And I do a special dedication to Stefan about the resolution of our technique. Even if the picture looks very nice in the electron microscope, the, the image comes from, from the, the, the scattered electron at, at the surface. But even if you take a one nanometer beam size and energy of 10 electron volts, when you use electron to, to, to probe, this is very well known that you have a peer of interaction. And I did that that night. It took me five seconds, probably, because it's a, a program made for that. So you have an, uh, an interaction, an interaction sphere or peer between the electrons and the matter, which makes it to a resolution close to the one micron. In our case, in the ID21 beamline, we have a, a, a beam of 0 0.5 micro, micron at the, at the half width maximum, which makes a similar shape. So I think the resolution is basically the same between the two techniques. So when we use our data, and we plot the SiO2 content in the liquid, and uh, we model, because we have the partition coefficient, so we take uh, chondritic or polarytic material, and we then calculate how much iron should go in the, in the liquid, we find our liquid composition that, that is here, so that the magma should float. So this is what we think, whatever the pr is the pressure, because we find that the that the, that the partition coefficient remains basically uh, similar. And I forget to say in the, in the previous diagram that all the data there were the scattering of the, um, some scattering due to composition mainly for all the large volume press experiments that uh, analyze this uh, partitioning of the iron in between silicates and, and also the degree of partial melting can be changed here in the different things and the degree of partial melting is something we don't control very well in our experiments, but we control basically relatively well the liquidus. I mean, we have here is a liquidus phase and, and, uh, and the liquid. So what are the implications for that? And here I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because the implications you will see in next transparent are, are not fantastic. They're not very original. It's what we know forever. We know from a long time, I mean, it could be wrong, it's not because people proposed that it was better, but what, what, what it does it mean is the solid phase is going to sink down, and this was, was modeled very well. How uh, here, a refractory phase would, uh, would uh, crystallize and sink down and, and, and uh, get some liquid blocked in between the grains, so a little bit, little bit of liquid here blocked in between the grains, and the, and the, the, the two or three phases that would sink would produce something that here is pretty close to pyrolite. And then you will crystallize the, the, the mantle progressively that you obtain something that is not as uh, segregated as, as you could imagine if you really put one phase here, one phase there. If the, if the liquid would go down, indeed you would create a, a lot of, uh, of uh, segregation because here it's more hot and, and the solid would go up, so it would crystallize even more. In this case, you have something that is, is basically taking place progressively and, and that, that prevents this, this huge amount of, uh, of uh, segregation. In the, in the other picture here, it's, it's about the plumes. So I'm not claiming the, the liquid would, would go up, but I'm claiming the, the liquid should be present in the, in the most hot areas. And the most hot areas are the ones that's going to go up. So is it some partially molten part in the, in the, in the hot spot that would go up? Maybe, and if, if you remove some, some perovskite uh, grains that would crystallize, if you remove them from there, it would make the, 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 the piece here even more buoyant, as we saw the perovskite is more uh, dense than, than the liquid. So it, I think it's, it fits uh, the general picture better in general. So, about uh, the thing I already told, so I'm going to be relatively rapid. There's one thing here I didn't sp speak about, 
is uh, the rising of uh, uh, pockets of liquid. Since they, they, might be, they might be buoyant, one could expect that the pocket could go up. But this is probably not efficient at all, because uh, if, if a pocket would, would rise a little bit in the mantle, due to the thermal gradient that has some chances to be, to be relatively steep, they, they will cool down. And if they cool down, they, they, would, they would go rapidly to a domain where it's completely solid. So a, a liquid uh, droplet or liquid pocket that is even slightly more rich in iron that would go up, cool down, crystallize, would never go very far. So I think this can, it's, it's not possible to have some liquid going up, I think, like this to the metal. But rising with, with engaged larger amount of material rising up, this could be much more uh, probable. So thank you very much. Thank you.